And that's what makes great story is having character and setting and narrative movement and, you know, dynamic change and, and all of these things. That's Ian Frisch, my guest today, an author of Magic is Dead. My Journey into the World's Most Secreted Society of Magicians, published by Day Street. This is CNF, the creative nonfiction podcast where I talk to badass writers, filmmakers, radio producers, and podcasters about the art and craft of telling true stories. But first, a word from our sponsor. Creative Nonfiction Podcast, that's CNF, is sponsored by Goucher College's Master of Fine Arts in Nonfiction. The Goucher MFA is a two-year low-residency program. Online classes let you learn from anywhere, while on-campus residencies allow you to hone your craft with accomplished mentors who have Pulitzer Prizes and best-selling books to their names. The program boasts a nationwide network of students, faculty, and alumni, which has published 140 books and counting. You'll get opportunities to meet literary agents and learn the ins and outs of the publishing journey. Visit goucher.edu slash nonfiction to start your journey now. Now! Take your writing to the next level and go from hopeful to published in Goucher's MFA program for nonfiction. That's right. How's it going, CNFers? You feeling good? It's May. It is the month of May. We are in it. We are almost halfway through 2019. It's a crazy time to be alive, man. You know, you can subscribe to this show on iTunes, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify. Show notes are always at brendanomera.com. Hey, hey. And you can sign up for my monthly newsletter there. Book recommendations, articles, and what you might have missed from the world of this CNF and podcast. I've also got this other little podcast thing going called Casualty of Words. It's a micro podcast about three minutes long. Every day is part of the 100 Day Project. Uh, it's pretty fun. Check it out. Subscribe. Do your thing. As for the newsletter, you just missed May's. But if you sign up, you'll get the next one. Once a month, no spam. As far as I can tell, you can't beat it. So I'm trying to write an essay in the form of a screenplay as a way to quote-unquote push the boundaries for a contest of sorts. I'm dragging my feet on it, even though the deadline is next week. So I'm kind of getting to that, you know, you're hosed territory. It's like, okay, this is this is what it's like. So I do this show and I read one to two books a week and do lots of research and I read all these books or articles and I'm like, the world doesn't need my work in it. It doesn't need m my shit. There's quite enough as is. I'm reading lots of Chuck Klosterman, his essays, but also his new book of short stories. And I'm like, well, no sense of playing this game anymore. It's not writer's block, because I don't believe in that shit. It's more like, I can't do anything that measures up to these people. I read for the show, you know? And people's attention's already so fractured, so I add more noise. Yeah, I know. It's a, sil it's a silly, stupid sentiment. I know that at the core, but I don't know. We make stuff because we need to make stuff, right? Hey, the Creative Nonfiction Podcast is also sponsored by Bay Path University's MFA in Nonfiction. Discover your story. Bay Path University is the first and only university to offer a no-residency, fully accredited MFA focusing exclusively on creative nonfiction. Attend full or part-time from anywhere in the world. In the Bay Path MFA, you'll find small online classes and a dynamic and supportive community. You'll master the techniques of good writing from acclaimed authors and editors, learn about publishing and teaching through professional internships, and complete a master's thesis that will form the foundation for your memoir or collection of personal essays. Special elective courses include contemporary women's stories, travel and food writing, family histories, spiritual writing, and an optional week-long summer residency in Ireland with guest writers including Andre DeBuse III, Anne Hood, and Mia Gallagher, among others. 
Start dates in late August, January, and May. Find out more at baypath.edu slash MFA. So, Ian Frisch is here. He is a master freelance features writer whose work has appeared in, wait for it, The New Yorker, The New York Times, Washington Post Magazine, Playboy, Wired, Vice Sports, Rolling Stone. So, yeah, my man can ball. Magic is Dead is his first book, and it's great. I loved it. Loved it. This episode is a freelancer's dream. We take a deep dive into how he forms his queries, how he deconstructs what magazines want so he can formulate better pitches, how he reports, how he works. Lots of great stuff. He's Ian Frisch, I-A-N-F-R-I-S-C-H on Twitter, and at Ian underscore Frisch on Instagram. There's probably some magic trips going, tricks going on there. And visit his website, ianfresh.com, to get more familiar with his work. I think that's it. This is me and Ian. Let's do it. I grew up in central Massachusetts, which is kind of close to where I went to college at UMass Amherst. And, uh... So what was your, you know, your your upbringing like with, uh, you know, uh, uh, with your father who, who was like, uh, you know, came from Ohio, super working class, super hard worker, and I and, and your mom who helped uh, pr- pretty much raised you and your sister. So what was that like growing up? We weren't, you know, cosmopolitan people. You know, we we very much were this kind of down home blue collar family and growing up it was kind of it was kind of set out that you were going to have that same life you know what i'm saying yeah and it was it 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 didn't really feel like there were options outside of that and it wasn't like I knew there were options outside of that and I wanted to achieve them, but I couldn't. It just was the nature of the upbringing, you know, living in a New England town and having parents who set forth and, and, and idolized entrepreneurship and, you know, blue collar professions and, you know, kind of making your own way. Those types of ideals were set in me from a very young age. And it was always kind of promoted that, you know, hard work, looking out for those you love, staying close with your family. Those are the things that are going to promote success later in life. And as I got older, you know, in my early teen years um, and preteen years, you know, it started becoming more apparent that, hey, you know, this could be something that I really would enjoy doing, um, you know, I was always a pretty precocious student across the board, but I, you know, I, I I loved English, but I also loved math and I really enjoyed the concept of building things or figuring out how things worked, taking things apart. And, you know, when I was that age, I was kind of like, you know, maybe I could be an engineer or I could be an architect or, something like that because my father was was a, a tile man he he owned his own tile company and and his a whole thing was you know uh, I've gotten this far but I really want you to kind of go above and beyond this like if I can get this far coming from you know basically poverty in 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 Ohio you know if I can leave that and make it to here living in a stable middle class town and you know have a nice house and have a wife and two kids you know, you can even go further than that. And that was kind of the path that was kind of set out for me, you know, so it's, it's interesting to think back on that and see how much has changed over the past 15 years. Mm. Yeah. And you were also, you know, I uh, gleaned this from the book. You were also a pretty good athlete too, right? Yeah. I mean, I was a quarterback for my youth football team and, uh, you know, that was a huge thing too, was, you know, sports was a huge part of my life and, the concepts of teamwork and leadership. And those go hand in hand with being a good entrepreneur or businessman or businesswoman, 
because you have to be a leader to those work under you, but you have to work as a team uh, in order to accomplish the larger goal. So all of these sorts of activities that related to a pretty typical middle class upbringing all fed into you know what it meant to try to become an adult. You know these values are instilled in you, and you're supposed to carry them into your teenage years, your college years, and your adult life. So that was all kind of part of it. But you know it's it's such a departure from from where I am now on the surface level. But I think all of those. I think all of those ideals are still with me. They're just applied in different ways. Oh yeah, the the fact that you know you 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 learned a lot of entrepreneurship from your father, and you had a knack for deconstructing things and taking things apart. I mean, that is the very nature of of being a writer too, and a freelance writer. You, like Susan Orlean says, like if you're going to be a freelance writer, you are you are running a small business, and if you have if there are pieces you want to write out there and you want to write in a certain style, then it helps to work backwards and break up, break up the structure and see like, how, how did the, how did John Jeremiah Sullivan or Tom Juneau or Susan Orlean, how do they write these things? And then you realize once you break it down into those fundamental parts, it's like, Oh, this is manageable. I just have to do the work and work through the steps. I talked to a lot of other writers about what it means to understand a story. And I, and I always relate it back to an engineering problem. If you're going to build a building or design a contraption or anything, you have to have all the correct parts for it to work. And that's what makes great story is having character and setting and narrative movement and you know dynamic change and, and all of these things. And it's really interesting because the ability to understand that on, on a craft level combined with an, uh, this inherent sense of – unburdened curiosity, which I've always been enamored with. I've always been very curious about certain things. They go hand in hand. But it obviously goes without saying that if my father hadn't died when I was 13, I would not be a writer today. Because the transition into applying these values into something that allowed me to kind of make sense of the world or to explore it in in a more profound way wouldn't have been necessary. I could have gone along this path that was basically spelled out for me and that I was willing to accept and that I probably would have found to be fulfilling in some way. That requirement was no longer necessary because I wasn't doing it for anyone. You know, I reflecting on this now and I talk a lot about this in the book is as the underlying emotional theme is trying to find the truest version of yourself. And I think when you go back to understanding how you were raised and the value systems that were implanted in you, a lot of value systems for people growing up are structured in a way that lends them opportunity in terms of career or social mobility, things like that. I mean, a parent wants the best for their child. But these values have to be applied in some way. And without the guiding force of my father after he passed away, I still held on to these values, but it was kind of up to me to find a way to apply them. And as I became older in my teenage years, a few years after he passed away, I took a career writing class in high school, something that I want to say was maybe a requirement, but I was kind of intrigued by it. I'd begun to read more around this time. Because again, you know, we weren't a, a family with like the New York Times laying around or the New Yorker. I, I don't think I read my first New Yorker article until I was in college. So it was this kind of strange sort of progression I was going through personally on that level. And when I took this class, I was really enthralled by it because of the inherent freedom with the written word. So I was like, man, th this could be something that that's really fun because it made me feel good. And my mother was obviously very supportive of this because she understood that, you know, with my father not being around, that it was going to be much more up to me to be able to say, okay, the world is right here for you. How do you want to take it? How do you want to hold on to it? What do you want to do with it? So that was kind of the transition into how I decided to become a writer. And it's all really infused with this whole sort of life-changing event 
um, um, you know, from losing a parent. And, you know, as time goes on, I became more dedicated to the craft and trying to figure out how I can make it work in a practical way while still staying close to the parts of it that I love the most and the type of writing that, that I really wanted to do as I became, I don't know, I guess a, a working professional, if you want to call it that. Yeah. The, um, the passing of your, of your father from, from a devastating stroke, uh, when you were, what, like you said, when you were 13, um, it seemed to, um, you know, you talk, uh, it, it really, it seemed to do something special to the relationship you have with your mom too. And that comes through in the book a lot. Like it, it, it allowed her to spread her wings in a way that she wasn't before, even though through immense grief, but it let her kind of chart her own course. And I want to say, do you think her being free in that way was also part of the reason why she could turn to you and say like, Ian, you need to go find, find your way now too. Yeah. I think my mother knows more, knows better than anyone that, that, that life is a series of sacrifices and especially being a woman, she had to sacrifice a lot of herself for the betterment of the family unit. When she was younger in her late teens and early twenties, you know, she was kind of a wild card, you know, like she, she did like road trips across the country. She loved to play poker. She loved to play pool. She was like a bar rat. And when she met my father, when she met my father, when they were in their twenties and they started kind of a serious relationship and they wanted to start a family, you know, she understood that she had to put that piece of herself aside for the betterment of this future plan. And this plan was kind of everything because it was the kind it, it it was the only way out. It was the only way for them to elevate in terms of quality of life and, you know, to have a real family and to provide fulfillingly for the kids. And that plan worked out really well, obviously, until it didn't. You know, my mom and dad built their dream house. Uh, they finished it like less than a year before my dad died. So they had gotten this far and then the whole thing is thrown into disarray. So what do you do at that point? You know, um, for me, it was kind of like, all right, this path that was kind of set for me in, in, in the early stages of my life is kind of dissipating. And now I have freedom to make my own choices. But my mother understood that she had obligations to be a mother and she continued to be a really great mother, but she also had to find a way to kind of find herself again. So she began playing poker again. That was one of her main coping mechanisms. And I didn't really understand it was a coping mechanism until much later when I started writing this book because of the connection between deception at the card table and deception in magic. But that was kind of her thing was I can go sit down at a poker table and I don't have to be a mom tonight. I don't have to be Pam tonight. I can be this whole other person. I can exude skills that I don't need to use in my everyday life. And that was a way I think for her to kind of try to move on or find purpose, you know, was to dedicate herself to this game. And, you know, her and I played poker and we still do quite frequently. You know, she played almost full time when I was in high school and during uh, my college years. So that was really a way for her to kind of come to terms with this. And that's definitely part of the story as well, because I feel like a tragedy like losing a husband or losing a parent isn't something that just kind of happens and then your life just continues. It's something that becomes part of you. And that's kind of what the book is about too. And it's about how you deal with that and about how you come to terms with that. And I think that, you know, a lot of people talk about this book and they're like, oh, it's you're hanging out with magicians and you become a magician and et cetera. But the real story is like, it's like a coming of age drama where, you know, this, this guy, me is at a point in his life where he's kind of looking for this epiphany or this situation to kind of prove to himself that he, that it's okay, that the man he's become is, is satisfactory. And, you know, at the same time for my mother, it's something that she can look at at a time and she can say, you know, where my children are and where I am, you know, we got through this. And, you know, I think that that's really what the book is about. Um, you know, 
aside from the whole kind of top level fun adventurous stuff with these young magicians. But when you get to understand the characters that I kind of involve myself with, we're all kind of on the same journey. And I think that that's what make, makes this book really special is that it has that emotional layer, you know, which is something that I've always tried to find in things that I write is that there has to be something at stake here for the main character. Um, aside from just the action itself, there has to be something at stake emotionally. And I think that all of this really folds into what this book is really about. Yeah. When I was reading it, I, I, Early on, and this is just, you know, of course, the, the a reader's subjectivity about what the book really felt like it was about, and that that animating force to me really felt like, all right, here was here was this family that got you know disrupted by the by this tragedy, and all these magicians that you engender yourself with, they all come from fairly like kind of broken backgrounds too. So this book really felt to me about family and finding your family. Um, does that does that kind of resonate with you, or at least make sense on some level? Yeah, I mean, every person has their own story, and it's it's really about finding the 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 underlying theme of their journey and why they do what they do. And it was fairly late in the process of reporting and then writing the book that I realized that everyone was kind of on the same journey, you know, to find the truest version of themselves and to be okay with that and to say, you know, despite every, everything I've come from and everything I've inherited as an adult, I've, I've done the best to be who I am. And I'm proud of that. And it is about finding comfort in the present, not only with who you are, but what you do. And to some extent too, like finding a family of people who have gone through similar things. And I think magic in general and magicians in general gravitate towards this craft because of that. You know, it, it kind of attracts loners or introverts because they see an inherent power in the ability to harness deception. And I mean, when I say that, I, I immediately think of my mother in the same way. So it's kind of interesting the parallels and between the two and the tools people seek out to, to use in their lives to try to understand themselves more or potentially better themselves. Mm. And you know that was something that I saw with basically everyone that became a main character in this book. And so when you were when you took that creative writing class in high school and it started to it, things started to change for you in terms of how you approach reading and, and writing, of course. Uh, who were you reading at that time that was starting to unlock that part of you and uh, made you want to like sort of pursue that? Well, my mother is a huge Stephen King fan. So basically the only books in our house when I was growing up were Stephen King books. Um, so I remember reading a couple Stephen King books when I was – in high school, just because they were available to me at that time. And I just, I thought it was interesting. I wasn't really enamored by the stories themselves, but that I could picture a person sitting down and writing them. That was the thing. I was like, wow, like someone can just think this stuff up and write it. And it's an, you know, and it's an, uh, an entertaining or enthralling read. That was kind of kind of sparked it for me was that, wow, someone has the power to create this experience for someone else, which is, you know, a very similar thing to performing magic tricks if you if you think about it. But I didn't really understand high level craft of writing, I think, until I was in college, because, like I said, again, like I lived in a very small town in Massachusetts and there really wasn't a lot of culture in terms of keeping up with the arts you know like you know I at that time in high school I, I didn't know what the Pulitzer Prizes were I didn't know what any of this stuff was you know like it just wasn't available to me you know understanding the systems of arts and culture in that way were well what was good literature and what wasn't I mean these sorts of things didn't really exist for me so over time I kind of stumbled upon them naturally but I remember you know, in college, like I said, like reading The New Yorker for the first time and seeing what 
really talented nonfiction writers can do. You know, and then I remember reading In Cold Blood for the first time in college, and I was just like blown away by the execution of that. And that was when I was falling in love with journalism because I was like, you know, journalists go out in the world and they meet people and then they translate their experiences to an audience. And it's a life of adventure because you're experiencing new things all the time. You're constantly learning. And, you know, as I started to understand what journalism really was on the craft level, you know, news journalism versus feature writing versus books versus this versus that, I kind of understood that that's where that's where the craft can be pushed to the highest level. And I think that that's where the most excitement sort of laid. So that was, you know, that was kind of the early stages of, of really understanding that side of it all. <clears throat> and I think once I got to that point, especially in college, I started reading a lot more, a lot more literature and nonfiction. And, you know, that's where I kind of became more in tune with how to achieve this kind of this kind of level of execution as to what makes good writing versus bad writing and how I could adjust my application to the craft to kind of get those results that I wanted from my own work. I know when I was uh, studying journalism, I, I quickly gravitated more towards uh, feature writing and narrative nonfiction versus like hard news and breaking news. It just appealed to my taste more. Yeah, uh, same. Yeah. Yeah. I was like, like, likewise, you know, when you were studying, like how, what was it about one versus the other that really gravitated well, or really pulled you in? I mean, to me, it's like I want to be taken on a journey a bit. If I'm going to dedicate my time to a piece of writing, I'm not, I'm not really just there for the information. I want to be able to understand the character and their motivations and their experiences on a deeper level. And when your goal is to do that, the amount of freedom you have with the words increases, which allows for a more pleasant experience you know, the way people structure their sentences or how they tell a story, the details they choose to use, the word, uh, the words that they use to kind of get these points across or to generate these feelings. And that always appealed to me much more. I want to say I read, I want to say it was a Bill Buford piece. I'm going to look it up actually right now. It's about chocolate. Mm. It was in, it was in the New Yorker, uh, I love those kind of features that on the surface yeah. they seem so simple but then like these writers they just through reporting and rigor and research they just go down the rabbit hole and you're like whoa like that's yeah. what this is exposed so it's called Extreme Chocolate The Quest for the Perfect Bean by Bill Buford October 22nd 2007 I remember reading that um into you know when it first came out and I was like this is wild like you know this type of writing can be published and can be seen as something worthwhile. And then, you know, once you kind of get a taste of that stuff, that's all you're really looking for. And then you kind of dig deeper and you're finding writing that is similar in its, you know, in its presentation and in its tone and in its kind of pacing, you know, and that was kind of where it, it started for me, I guess. I remember that piece quite vividly. And again, like reading In Cold Blood and things like that, I was just like, man, like, I want to write stuff like this. Like, that's what I want to do. And I want to find a way to practice it so I can get better at it. But I also want to be able to understand why these stories or these ideas turn out well in the end. I mean, I've definitely had my slip ups when it comes to thinking a story is really great. Once you get into the material, you realize you're missing a large piece of it or this or that, or it's just not going to work for the format in which you're kind of commissioned to do it. But I, you know, I really knew that this level of writing required a lot of time and patience 
But that's really what I wanted to do from the onset. And I've done, you know, news reporting here and there, but I, I really try to dedicate myself to more substantial features, even in the early parts of my career, because I knew that those were the types of articles that would potentially lead to greater opportunities. You know, like if you practice that type of writing in a newspaper or magazine format, you're probably going to be better suited to tackle a book project down the line because you understand the type of narrative beats you have to hit. You have you understand how characters have to be fleshed out over a period of time. So that, you know, a lot of that was just culminating um, into, I guess, how I was able to execute this book. So that was the type of writing you identified early that you wanted to do. So what were the next logical steps for you to start manifesting the kind of writing you wanted to do and landing these pieces in places that will, you know, pay you fairly for the the time that it takes to make these make this kind of work? Well, it was it was a difficult road to be honest because, you know, the whole catch 22 about this is that you need experience to do this type of writing. But no one wants to give someone the opportunity to do this type of writing without experience. Right. So I was kind of like, all right, I'm going to have to do a lot of this potentially on my own if this is the type of writing I really want to dedicate myself to. So that's where I'm, I was kind of at. I graduated from Champlain College in Burlington, Vermont, this small liberal arts college. And I had a degree in writing. And I was allowed to do a lot of, a lot of this more ambitious stuff there. Because I think I was one of the only people who really wanted to try to do it. I got an internship at Rolling Stone. I, I worked there probably for five or six months, around five months, I think, um, in, in the latter half of 2009, right after I graduated. But obviously, 2009 was like the worst year to graduate college since the Great Recession. And media was tanking because they hadn't yet figured out how to make money on the Internet. And print ad revenues have been going down. So I get to Rolling Stone. And, you know, they were, I think there was only like three or four people working for the website at the time. Mm. And, you know, print was really tight. And I just kind of saw firsthand the overall situation that magazines were in. And it kind of didn't look good. You know, this, this is before BuzzFeed and Vox and all these companies now that, that you can work for. So I was kind of like, man, you know, and there were no jobs and after my internship, I, you know, I couldn't get a job. I was just like, all right, well, I don't want to leave New York. I don't want to abandon this sort of dream that I have. So maybe I can make something work. So I got a job at a hotel. I was waiting tables, working evening shift from four to midnight. And then I started um, a magazine with a bunch of friends where a lot of my friends were photographers or illustrators. And, you know, I was just kind of bringing everyone together so we could do this publication that I was kind of spearheading. And I would use some money from my night job to help fund it. And it was not profitable at all. I definitely lost money on it, like over the years, a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But because it was my magazine, I could do whatever I want. So I had a lot of freedom to write pieces in the way that I want. And I really saw it as an exercise of practice. So that's really what I used it for. And I ran that publication for about three years, I think, a little over three years. And towards the end of that, I, I knew I wanted to be done with it because I wanted to kind of take these skills and kind of enter the freelance market because I saw that magazines in general were becoming more stable over that time. This was in 2014 going into 2015. And during 2014, I had done a personal project about um, these triplet brothers that live on this small fishing island off the northern coast of Iceland. And I wrote this, you know, I did it for myself, and it ended up getting subsequently published on Latterly, which is, I believe, a now defunct kind of international publication. But it was this 10,000-word article, and it was about these triplets, the only triplets to ever be born on this island. And one of the triplets died when they were children, and now the brothers are adults. And it was kind of about, you know, the brother dying and recreating that day. And it was kind of this exercise in this sort of high-level, like David Grand style, like recreating 
events in vivid detail. Mm -hmm. And I was really proud of that piece. And I was like, man, like, I really think that, you know, I'm at a point where my skills can be translated into like real assignments for real publications. So in 2015, like that's what I decided to do. And I knew I had like a lot of really great practice in doing this type of work. And I really wanted to kind of jump into it. And one of the first bigger pieces was actually one of my first pieces as a freelancer. I had pitched Vice Sports this story about how women, uh, female bodybuilders were being pressured through the sport into getting breast implants because the sponsors for the competitions could sell more stuff and the magazines that own the competitions, you know, put the winners on the cover. And if the winners ha are, are more feminine, then they can sell more ads for the magazines. It was just like whole sort of racket thing. So I did that investigation and that was quite long too. It was about 7,000 words, but it had a lot of depth to it and a lot of nuance. And that's what kind of started it. And I really stuck, try to stick to that brand every time I pitched a story where I thought, you know, there was at least some element of character or narrative or, you know, a sense of public service with an investigative element. And I really tried to keep those things going as I gained more steam in the freelance space. And also, too, that, that obviously carried over into how this book came about. But that was, you know, kind of what I stuck to. I was like, okay, I don't want to get into this trap where I'm writing basically blog posts for websites for $300 a pop. You know, I want to tell real stories, you know, with real significance and characters with something at stake and a bigger picture takeaway and an emotional layer and, you know, all of these things. So I really tried as best I could to kind of stick to those things throughout all of the pieces that I started writing over the subsequent years. Would you say that that bodybuilding piece was that kind of the the first one that started the snowball for you to be able to start landing similar pieces in different markets that um you know that were prominent and visible and, and paid decently? Yeah, I think so because I think it showed like a, like a like a level of reporting skill and when you look at that story you're like wow like okay, I definitely know what I'm doing to a certain extent. Was it as graceful or nuanced as some of the stuff that, that you see in the bigger magazines? No, but the bare bones are there in terms of being able to do a quality job reporting and to write something that has substance. But that was kind of the, the starting point. But again, you know, I always come back to the fact that a good idea knows no experience late, uh, experience level or age, you know? So I tell kids that, you know, I'm like, it doesn't matter how old you are. It doesn't matter how many years you have uh, like under your belt, a really great idea can carry you quite far. And I, and I always kind of knew that it's like, you know, as a freelancer, especially one where I didn't have many pre-existing relationships with editors or any relationships at all. It, it was my idea that that was going to carry me, and that the writing was going to come second, where if I have a really great idea and I can pitch it well, the editor has a sense that I can probably write it and execute it as well. So that was really my thing, is I really wanted to try to work in that sort of way until I got to the point like where I am now, where I can be a little bit more choosy and I can, you know, take longer on pieces and, you know, dig deeper for different ideas here, like here and there. But, you know, where I was back then, I was like, I just need really compelling ideas. Because if I get a compelling idea, I can put that in front of an editor, and they're going to be able to run with it with me. Mm -hmm. But over time, you know, these sorts of things kind of started compounding upon each other. You know, I started doing more stories for Vice Sports, you know, that kind of culminated into this really long profile of Shaquille O'Neal that I did um, in late 2015 as well. And, you know, securing access for that, you know, and having Vice behind me saying, if you can get access to him, then, you know, we'll definitely send you. And then being able to put out like that kind of narrative 
a lot, like a lot of visual detail about being there with him and watching him and his interactions with his family and, you know, this really great access that allowed that piece to shine. You know, I think that was a, a turning point for me too, where I kind of saw that, okay, like I can really do this. And, you know, that was a really great opportunity for me too. And then all that stuff just started kind of snowballing into bigger publications, better pay, et cetera, et cetera. And that's um, that that point of access is is important too. And it looked like with the Vice Sports piece, you had a relationship there, so they were like, "That sounds like a great idea. Go get access, and we'll greenlight it." But oftentimes, if you don't have that relationship, you have to sometimes secure access without knowing that you can land the piece. So, so probably early on, you probably had a lot of those experiences. So, like, how did you? go about lobbying for the access you needed and pre-report enough that you could draw up a good enough query that got the attention of editors to then turn you loose for the shack story or uh, let's see well we can do the shack story but i'm thinking too because that one you you kind of got it sounds like it was like oh we'll run with this piece if you can get the access but other times Sometimes you need to go find access before you can even successfully lobby for a piece. So right. yeah, in, in the days before you had that kind of relationship with, with an editor at Vice, you know, how were you going about getting access, not necessarily knowing if you could land the story you were hoping to pitch? <clears throat> I mean, a lot of the time, and I, and I still have to do this, you know, if I, if I can isolate an an idea that I think holds promise, and I and I know that there's a main character at the center of it. I normally just reach out to them and I say, "Hey, I'm a freelance journalist. You know, I've written for these magazines. You know, I think you have an interesting story. I'd like to just chat with you a little bit on background, just to get a little bit more information and to ask some questions, and I can kind of talk to some editors to see maybe if someone's interested. I think it could work for." you know, XYZ or, you know, ABC magazine or, you know, whoever, you know, I'd usually give a list, like it could work for these people. And I usually get on a call and I kind of flesh it out and I kind of try to get to, okay, you know, what's the news item? Um, you know, what's at stake for you personally? What's the, what's the bigger picture here? You know, how is, you know, um, is there a beginning, a middle and an end to this? And, you know, once I can kind of understand that, by having just a kind of informal chat with the with the subject, I'm then able to write that pitch. You know, and obviously ask them, like, hey, would you would you go on record or, you know, hey, you have this thing coming up, you know, that is integral to the story that I, I'd love to be there for. Like the news item is happening. Like, can I be there with you? And, you know, could I hang out with, you know, members of your family or other people who are integral to the story? And you kind of get all that. And then when you pitch the story, you're able to do that. I mean, that's how I go about it, and that's how I still go about it. I mean, I just did that like two days ago for a new idea. So, I mean, but sometimes it takes a lot longer. Sometimes it takes a lot longer to kind of gain that access. I mean, I'm working on a story right now. I'm I'm just about to put it to bed. That's coming out this spring, and you know, it's kind of a, involves like a crime plot, and I had to wait, I don't know, five months to secure access for the main character. And, you know, some of that for bigger stories is just part of the game. But, you know, to be able to identify those hurdles and to prioritize based upon them makes being a freelancer a little bit easier. But I, I always try to secure access before I pitch. I always try to talk to my at least main character in the story before I go to an editor, because those are the main questions they're going to have for you when you pitch. Like, okay, great, great story, but do we have access to this person? Or, you know, I see your vision of the piece, but, you know, are you going to be able to report it out? You know, because the because the last thing you want is, be, is to get to the end of an assignment and you're missing, you know, crucial parts of the story. So, yeah, that that's usually the process I go through. It just makes the whole you know, the, the the whole situation easier about getting an assignment. And obviously, the better access you have, the more promising the story becomes, and then the more support you're going to get from the publication, you know, the, maybe they'll shoot you some travel budget or this or that. And that's, you know, that's part of the whole thing, too, is the more support you get from the publication, obviously, the better the story is going to be. Yeah, if if 
writing the story is the art, then often the pitch is there's more or less a science to the pitch. Like you got to hit these kind of these beats, so you can lot to say the tell the editor like this is why it's good for you. This is why I'm great to write it. Um, so or qualified to write it. So what is how did you over time uh, hone your querying process to get to the point where you were you had a pretty good batting average. Uh, and and at, once you had that good batting average, like what did, you know, what did the process or how how frequently were you pitching too? Yeah, I mean, if you want to go back to the engineering metaphor, that's how I kind of went about it. I mean, I used to go to like, I would go to Barnes and Noble a lot, and I would sit down and I would read magazines that I really loved: Bloomberg, Business Week, Wired, New York Times Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. I'd read all these magazines. I wasn't really reading them for the content per se. I was reading them in terms of what the content said about what the editors want and need. Mm. And what I mean by that is that if you look at GQ, Esquire, Wired, et cetera, their front of books and their feature wells are basically the same thing every single issue with just new content plugged in. But each piece and each section serves a greater purpose for the magazine as a whole because magazines – And magazine editors want the entire book to be an experience for you where you can go through and you can get some service journalism. You can get some short features. You can get some investigative stuff. You can get this or that. And I was kind of reading these these pieces with the understanding that each one serves a purpose for the larger whole. And and what and what do what do they really try to do for the magazine as a product? So that's where I really started to get my footing a little bit better was when I started kind of looking at it from that perspective. And I would say, you know, and then when I would find an idea, I would think, okay, what magazine would this work for and where exactly could it fit? Because sometimes you give an idea to a publication and they're like, yeah, but it's hard for us to put it in there or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, for Wired, just as an example, I started realizing that almost all of their front of book stuff was super visual and a lot of the writing was a lot smaller. So I started to think, well, maybe they think about it in terms of if it's going to look good on the page and there's enough writing behind it, that's, that's the sweet spot. And I remember one of my first stories for them, I had pitched a story about this highway interchange in Dubai that was like this unique design that hadn't been used before and it was just like an interesting sort of you know problem solver because Wired's whole thing is how has technology solved a problem and it should be act one problem presents itself act two technology comes to the rescue and solves a problem and act three is how the world is better because of that that is every single story right Mm -hmm. And I had seen this amazing photograph of this thing, and I researched it a little bit, and that's exactly what happened is that it was super dangerous in this area of Dubai, and they used this really interesting, complex highway interchange to fix it, and now it's less dangerous and less congested. And I pitched them. I sent the image. I was like, look at how cool this thing looks. And I was like, here's the backstory, and they were like, perfect. And they ran the the image that I sent them. They licensed it from the photographer and ran it. So that was just me like looking through this magazine and being like, why do they do what they do? And a lot of times it's difficult to get that information from an editor because they don't necessarily have the time to explain all of this to you. So that was that that, that was one thing. And another thing was, um, you know, I go back to this story I did for Bloomberg Business Week about this um, the first U.S. business that was allowed to set up manufacturing operations in Cuba. And it was these, and it was surprisingly enough, these two old guys from Alabama who made tractors. And I saw that story on the AP when it first came out. It was like a super small news item. And I was just like, that's a perfect Bloomberg Business Week story because they see this larger news item, this kind of vague thing where it's like the embargo's lifted and everyone's talking about that. But they want like the character driven, you know, side door into this larger issue. And that was like the perfect story for them. So that was like my first feature for them. And, you know, they sent me to Alabama. They let me write, I think it was almost 2,500 words. You know, I got to go on Bloomberg TV and talk about that story. And that was only because I had been reading their stories and understanding that like, like, okay, everything here is just the side door. And like the interesting kind of narrative that people aren't really 
kind of seeing underneath a larger kind of topical conversation. So those are the kind of things that I was like finding were successful. Same thing goes for the New Yorker when I was writing for them. I was reading, you know, obviously the, the, the New Yorker in print, but also online. And I realized that they had a sports section, but they only were writing about like tennis and boxing because two of their staff writers like those sports basically. <laughs> and I was yeah. like, there are so many more interesting like off the wall sports stories that are really great that no one is seeing on this website. So that so that's how I got like this kind of string of kind of cool sports stories for them was because they had a void in their coverage. So it's just like, you know, those types of approaches will, is what really worked for me because it allowed my ideas to stand out because there was a need for them in that way. I, I like the a way of framing it is like if the story itself is to serve your ego, then the query is 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 an is an impact an act of empathy to understand the editor and their needs and then there's that overlapping circle of the empathic query and then the egotistical story you want to write and that overlap is where where the sweet spot is that's a career yeah i mean i think pitching is really all about understanding the editor's perspective because they're the firewall between publication and rejection and it's like, well, you know, what do they want? What do they need? You know, because all, editor need, all editors need great ideas. I mean, it's their job to curate the best ideas. I mean, that's what they are. They're curators of ideas. So it's, it's like getting into the mind of an editor and pressing for that sweet spot is what has proven to me the, to be the most successful. And obviously, too, as you gain a reputation, your stories get better, people are going to give you a little bit more leeway in terms of risk. They may allow you to write longer or they may give you more resources or they may let you kind of go off and do your own thing for a story. And, you know, once that leash gets extended a little bit, you can use that to kind of ramp up your voice or to try something new or to really, you know, push the boundaries in terms of, of, of telling larger stories or more complex stories, you know, and that's a byproduct of hard work over time. And also, you know, building this reputation and proving yourself to be trustworthy and reliable in terms of your side of the bargain and coming to the, you know, coming back after reporting with, with, with a good story, you know, and that's all part of the equation too. But, you know, for me, it's like sticking to my guns in terms of the stories I want to write has further provided more opportunities to write those types of stories. And what does the shape of your day look like in terms of uh, the how you balance your time between uh, the research of a market, like just looking at magazines, this is what they're looking for, uh, the kind of pre-reporting and re in you know, reporting you do, the writing, the reading, you know, how, how are you building your days as a small business around freelance writing so you can you know, continually get work? It's really different because it depends on the stage I am in terms of a piece I'm, I'm currently writing. So if it's a larger piece, you know, I could be working on one story for a couple weeks at a time or even upwards of a month, which would put me at only that every single day. But, you know, right now I'm in kind of like this in-between stage where I'm pitching new ideas. I'm waiting to, you know, tie the knot on a couple stories that are going to be going up soon. So during this time, I'm usually reading a lot. I read a lot every day, um, different magazines. I, I usually like to check out too, like, you know, what are some publications kind of doing right now? Um, you know, I kind of, I track editors sometimes, you know, are they saying anything on Twitter or other platforms about what they're kind of looking for? Are they looking for pitches? Have people moved jobs? You know, it's it's sometimes nice to pitch an editor who has just gotten a job at a new publication because, you know, they're kind of in the market probably for for great ideas because they are the the newbie in the room. Mm. You know, that, that 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 that's always a good thing. So I kind of do a little bit of that and then I'm always just kind of looking for ideas in general. And I, you know, I have like a document of ideas and some of them aren't ready. 
some of them are are perfect for pitching right now. Maybe I've I've missed a jump on on a story. So I have I have like a working document in terms of that. But in terms of, you know, a true day to day, you know, I wake up by I go to the gym. Um, I come home, I'm usually home by nine fifteen and I usually read for the first couple hours of the day, usually about an hour and a half. And you know, that's just kind of like setting the stage for what's going on in the world, but also what's going on in specific publications. And then I, you know, usually spend midday and into the afternoon um, either pitching editors or following up on pitches I've already sent or kind of going around looking for new ideas, sometimes thinking, okay, well, because of my research in the morning, you know, it seems that this publication is looking for tech stuff or this publication or this editor said that they're in the market for something like this or, you know, oh, here's a topic that's really hot right now nationally. And I think that a good character narrative within that would probably sell well because it's kind of on the top of people's minds, you know, maybe I'll spend the afternoon looking for stuff like that. Find anything interesting, put it aside. Maybe the next day I follow up on them. Um, maybe send some emails to people and sources to say, hey, you know, is there something here? Would you want to talk? You know, kind of going back to how I kind of set up a pitch. And if I get to the point where it's like, okay, this is definitely worth pitching, I write up a pitch. I make a list of publications in order of who I would want to have it first, second, third, all the way down the line. And then I start the pitching process where, you know, I'll take an idea that I'm confident will sell. I start with my number one choice. I give them, you know, maybe five to seven days and then I follow up and then also pitch the second option and then go down the line until it's sold. And then, you know, once it's sold, you can kind of, you know, book out when and how you're going to write it. If you have to travel, you put it on your calendar and then you kind of work your, your other ideas around that. And, um, you know, hopefully you have a full schedule over time. But I try to kind of do this overlapping continuously. I'm at this point with, with my book just coming out and like just now getting over like, you know, the press and being, you know, being kind of beholden to it for about a month afterwards. Yeah, I'm kind of doing this again, where it's like, you know, you kind of start to push the snowball down the hill a bit. And you want to keep that momentum going. So then you're always either pitching something new or finishing up edits on one thing or writing something new or, you know, researching stuff down the line. So then that way, you know, you're kind of in this rhythm and it kind of keeps going. So my day is a little bit of a little bit of all the above, depending on where I am in the overall process. Mm. Uh, when I was talking to Bronwyn Dickey uh, a few weeks ago, um, she's a good friend and she comes on the show every now and again and we just bullshit sometimes. And uh, she was saying that she she saw a talk or attended a talk with Lawrence Wright and he like pulled out his his backpack and kind of like spilled it on the table. And like, these are the tools I use when I'm reporting. And he had like various kinds of notebooks and this, that, and the other. And she thought that was just like, so cool. Like this is his tool belt that he brings with him out into the field. And I'd extend maybe a similar question to you. Like what, what are the things that when you're going on a reporting trip, whether that's just in the city or elsewhere around the country, uh, what are you bringing with you that you can't report without? Just my eyes and ears, really. I mean, I, I usually just leave my recorder on for hours at a time when I'm with someone, especially if I know I want to get more kind of narrative details from them. It's difficult. It, it's hard. And I, it, it, it's hard to put it this way, but I can go back to an example that the, the tractor story, you know, the two main characters have been best friends for a while. And I knew I really wanted to try to get something that showed their kind of dynamic between the two of them, these people who've been friends for 50 years. And, you know, they, 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 they had this really interesting relationship where they were kind of like, you know, uh, kind of joking, jokingly bickering with each other all the time in this way that old friends always do. And I was just like, man, I got to capture this in like a really great way. And they were getting ready to go to like a fundraising function and they were getting dressed, um, in one of the guy's homes. I was in the living room and I had my recorder on and and they were kind of bickering about what they should wear. And I thought that was just so funny because it's like they're a married couple. And, you know, that became the lead of the story. And that was only because I was really observing them and listening to them and watching them 
kind of uh, from a third party perspective where I wasn't just solely focused on getting the facts or getting the quote I needed or like, oh, I, I got to ask you this question. You know, I, I like to spend time just letting my characters kind of just be themselves and I'm just watching them because that's when you see kind of the real version of them and, and you know, how how they're going to best come across to the audience. You know, like, like, like if you read like Taffy Brodus or Ackner, when she does her profiles, like she, she does this beautifully where she allows the subject to be themselves. And when you, and this could be for a book or a long story, but once you're, once you're out there gathering your information, um, what is the next part for you? Like, how do you go about organize, like uh, sort of curating the research or just getting transcribing the research and getting it down and then organizing those kind of notes so you can access them later? Yeah. I'm pretty old school with this too. You know, one story I'm finishing up now, it's kind of like a family crime drama story. And I, and I knew from the outset that I could recreate the entire narrative because everything had already happened in the past. I wasn't necessarily witnessing anything of, of note first person. And I kind of had like the beats of the story kind of outlined in my head already. And I kind of just went in there and tried to fill them by asking questions that could kind of fill out those parts of the story. And when I got back, I had, after I transcribed my field notes and the audio, I probably had, I don't know, maybe like almost 40,000 words of, of notes, which is obviously a lot. And what I did was, um, you know, I had my field notes up top and I had, um, each interview, each interviewee underneath, sometimes multiple files, but I kept them by person and I printed it all out and it was, you know, about, I don't know, 80 pages of notes. And I just went through and if there's any detail or quote that I, I really loved, I would highlight it and I'd write a number on it. And on that number would be the section that we go in. Hmm. You know, I would say to myself, okay, there's probably this section, this story probably has five or six sections. And, you know, I'd write at the, at the header, you know, section one is this, section two is this. And all these details, I would just do one, two, all the way through five or six, right? And then as I was writing the story, I knew just by being immersed in the material what I was going to write per se. And then I would just go back and reference these like key details for each section. And that's what allowed it to fill it out. So as I'm writing, I'm just checking notes and I'm like, oh yeah, wasn't there a thing for section two related to this? And I go and I, oh, I find it. Okay. Yeah. That's what he said. And I put it back and, you know, I choose details to use as quotes or choose details to translate into narrative detail. And I keep going and going and going until the draft is done. And then I would go back over the notes or did I miss anything or did I mischaracterize or is, did I, you know, is there a quote I should use versus a narrative detail? It's just a really great quote. You know, and I do that a lot. I did that for my Playboy story that came out last year. That's like it was like a nine thousand word story about this black veteran who was killed by police. I did a very similar thing, where I'd go through and I would highlight and make notes on where where it should go in the story. You know, because you want to have your kind of lead should be one of the most important scenes um, that by itself doesn't make much sense you know that it's very important and then you start from the beginning and you allow the story to fill out so you get back to that point at the end so those are the kind of structures i use and you know they're quite typical i think for magazine features but to keep everything organized i really think in terms of sections because that's how stories are told you know beginning middle end beginning middle end how can i replicate that in my reporting and kind of organizational process so then when i get to the actual writing i'm not i'm not lost like I, I I know there are some people who are are stifled by from the writing angle the blank blank page. Um, for for me, I'm more I I get more anxious with a blank notebook page. Like not well, like shoot, like am I taking down the right information? Am I not? Am I taking down enough? Have I have I taken down too much? Blah blah blah. Um, so my anxiety kind of comes on the reporting end. The writing end kind of takes care of itself. Um, I wonder, like, do you have any hangups or anxieties when it comes to either the writing or the reporting? Yeah, I mean, I tend to over-report, which is 
a blessing and a curse. I mean, it's a blessing because you know that you've exhausted the material, but it can be a curse because it requires so much time. I think a lot of the times, sometimes uh, I tend to, I can overwrite in places that don't require that much detail. So the, I, I call it bloat, where mm -hmm. the article bloats itself. And that's where I, I really look to editors to try to like tone it down and say, you know, I don't want the reader to feel bored. If anyone's ever bored when they're reading my stuff, then I've failed. So how can I how can I get past that? You know, and I'm and I'm actively at this point trying to make my writing more fast and you know to to really stay interesting through every sentence because that's like the real key in terms of keeping someone with you. So that's kind of like uh, this anxiety that 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 I'm having is that you know how can I make sure that people are going to actually finish the piece. And how can I make sure that they're going to be entertained all the way through and, and informed to a degree where they come away saying that that was worth their time? And that's and that's always the, the harder thing, especially when you're doing longer pieces because there's more at stake in, in that regard. You know, you put so much time and effort into it, and if no one finishes it, then you haven't really done your job the right way. So that's that's really kind of where I'm at on that front. I mean, if I'm... If I'm pitching an idea to get an assignment, I know that it's going to be reported out, and I know that I can do that, and I really enjoy that process. I I'm, I salivate for opportunities to go up and report from the field especially. So I really love doing that. And then there is a time, once the reporting's done, there is a little bit of anxiety about, okay, exactly how am I going to structure this? Exactly how is it going to be told? But normally once I get through the reporting, those, sorts, those things start to click in my head. So I sort of understand them the better, like the better, um, the better attuned to the material I get. But I think that for me, it's it's much more on the like the line level where it's like, okay, the piece is written, but is it the best it can be? I mean, is there anything about this that's just not right that I should change? Are people going to get through it? Are they going to enjoy it? I mean, I think that those kind of pre-publishing anxieties are the ones I deal with the most. And even uh, masters like David Grant, like when I spoke to him, even someone like him, he's struck by the uh, deficiencies and self-confidence that will allow him to finish. And you, we, you know, people like you and me would look at David Grant and be like, this guy's a, this guy's a master. How can he possibly be stricken with, you know, deficiencies and confidence and, and doubt? And, um, it's great to know that people of that stature feel that. And I kind of extend that to you. Like if you have a crisis of confidence and self-doubt with the work you're doing, how do you power through that uh, so you can continually churn out the wonderful work you do? I don't know. <laughs> I guess I just asked for reassurance from my editors. You know, I, I, I'm a continually guy who's like, I'm like, this is good, right? You know, this is good, right? <laughs> You know, so it's like at that point, because sometimes I become quite numb to the material. Like I, I'm so obsessed with it or I love it so much that I don't really know where it's good or bad. Right. And it kind of just takes an outside perspective to say, you know, we're super strong here, but this is just we need more detail. And I'm going through this with one of my stories right now, the kind of family drama story where my editor was saying to me, you know, this is super cinematic. He's like, but you're kind of ticking off some of the biographical details where I feel like we could kind of build those out to be more emotionally relevant for our characters. And he's like, check out section two and three. And I was like, okay. And I went through and I was like, okay, that totally makes sense. But I didn't see that. Like I was so numb to it, you know, and I wasn't really thinking about those three, four, five paragraphs. But, you know, if you're a reader to slog through five paragraphs that just don't do it for you is a lot, you know. That's like four minutes of work, you know, five, six minutes of work, you know, and those things really matter when you're writing stories that are of this length that require that much commitment to read them. So, you know, I, I, I usually defer to my editors for, for those types of things. And sometimes these huge changes that they may throw on you that may seem like, oh, my God, like I failed. And they're like, no, like we just switched these couple things around. You'll see that the whole thing makes makes that much more sense and is that much more powerful because we're going through it this way. Yeah, and and given uh, sort of the social media climate among creative people, you know, looking on looking online, it can it can often feel like everybody else is crushing it and you're just like eating shit. And 
uh, when you are confronted with feelings of competition or jealousy, um, how do you how have you turned that faucet off and maybe rechanneled that energy into doing be, doing the work you're capable of? Yeah, I mean, I think that for me, a lot of it is is like looking up to people and instead of comparing myself to my peers, which I did for quite a long time. I think it's only I'm, natural. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, I'm, I've kind of gotten over that hump, especially in my early career. I was very much comparing myself to my peers because I was like, well, they're writing for those publications and, you know, um, I want to write for them too. And it's like, you know, or they're publishing more often than me and this or that. But I kind of got over that as I started just thinking, okay, well, I'm not trying to be them. I'm trying to be Patrick Radden Keefe. I'm trying to be David Grant. I'm trying to be these people that whose writing has carried me for years as kind of a, you know, a touch point of inspiration. So it's like, for me, I'm always trying to just do a little bit better than last time to find a story that's a little bit more compelling than last time to get placement that's a little bit better than last time. So then I know that these small steps will eventually pay off into something you know that is that is really fulfilling for me where i i feel like i can kind of take on any story or i can hit up you know a, a number of editors and they're all going to be interested in the idea and i'm slowly getting to that point but i think for me it's all about just sticking to the vision that i had at the onset of this whole journey you know and doing the writing that i continue to to fall in love with as a reader and, you know, continue to fall in love with as a writer and just never stop pursuing that goal. Because I know if I continue to push myself to be that type of writer, you know, one day I'll be able to sit there and say that like, yes, I I finally did it. And I'm, you know, I'm proud of, of the journey and I'm proud of all the hard work and I'm proud of where I am now. It's a daily grind, but you know I, I don't think I'd have it any other way. And uh, one section I, lo- I love in the book when you were talking to Madison, who was kind of having a a, a crisis of a vision, he was kind of burned out and uh, on on magic. And you were and you wrote uh, or said to him, "You're like, I mean, it's like writing. It's like any other artistic pursuit. Your career will evolve over time." And and how would you say that? your career has evolved in the time you've been, you've been doing these long features and maybe where do you see yourself going? <clears throat> Again, I, I, I think that the portfolio I've, I've kind of accumulated has, and the kind of trials and tribulations of getting these stories published has made me more critical of my own ideas in terms of what a story could be on the page but also at the same time has allowed editors to become more comfortable with giving me a little bit more risk with the ideas that I do want to push out there. And I think that's probably been the biggest accomplishment so far is, is allowing like prestigious editors or larger publications to be like, no, we trust you. Like, you know, go out there and we're going to put all of our eggs in this basket because we know that, you know, you're going to come away with something that's, you know, after some editing and after some back and forth is going to be an amazing piece. And that's like so reassuring in that way. And I, and I hope that that stuff can just continue where, you know, my stories can become more complex and, and more nuanced and better told because I'm continuing to progress as a writer myself. And it's, and it's all about that, that sort of balance game and that sort of collaborative environment where I'm seeking out editors that I know bring the best out of me. And hopefully these editors are seeking me out because they know that I can bring the best out of their instincts as a curator and that I can bring stories to their publication that best suit their overall mission. And that's kind of where I'm at. You know, like I I don't want to stop doing these types of stories and, you know, I do want to find my next book and I do want to just, keep the ball rolling and and continue to get better because, you know, that's kind of the name of the game for me is that if I'm not continually progressing, then, you know, what am I doing? 
What did you learn about yourself as a, a writer from doing the book versus the, the magazine pieces you had done prior? I mean, you look at a book, it's just such a different animal. I mean, you're, I mean, my book was 93,000 words, you know, that is, that's a lot of writing. And I think that the pacing of a book is what I was really, that I kind of struggle with in, in the early parts of writing it because in journalism, it's like, okay, when you need to give us the goods like pretty soon, but in, in, in a book, like you can really allow the story to evolve more slowly. And I kind of like that because I was able to kind of sit there and write with much more detail and at, and at much more length than I normally would. So that was, that was a huge learning curve for me, but I enjoyed it very much so because it really showed you how a book should be structured. You know, how do you keep someone with you? How do you keep their attention for 300 pages? You know, every so many chapters, you have to hit a beat. You have to hit a narrative beat. You have to hit the emotional beat. You know, you have to let the reader know that we're we're moving towards an ending that's going to be satisfying for you. And those are some of the how some of the best books are structured. And, you know, I just finished reading Say Nothing by Patrick Redden Keefe, and his structure and pacing is just masterful. Because after every chapter or every two chapters, like, all these beats are being hit. Like, every character is coming back in just enough of the right way to keep you interested to let you know that there is dynamic change, that things are, are moving forward and that, you know, he, he kind of sets the premise at the beginning as to what the ending should be. And he, and as you get closer, you know that you're going to be given the ending that, that you want. And I think that that's kind of the, 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 the bigger picture about understanding storytelling. It's not just like, Oh my God, here's this really cool thing. Let, like, like, let me write a story about it. Right. You have to know that the logistical and the emotional storylines are going to be resolved at the end you know like like you read white darkness by david grant you know his his new yorker piece and you know that this guy is pushing himself to the limit to accomplish this insurmountable kind of goal and you, in your head you're reading it and you're like this guy's either going to do it and live or he's not going to do it and he's going to die you, and you know it's one or the other and you know the ending's going to give you that, but it's you know, it's the way in which you tell it that brings out that tension, and it's the level of detail, and the pacing of it, that kind of puts forth its importance not only to the person reading it, but you know, to the context in which it happened, you know, to the to the guy's family, to to what it means to be a human in exploring the world in which we live, you know. All these sorts of things are wrapped up in these stories. With books, it's similar as a magazine story in terms of what it has to entail, but just on a much larger scale. So it was definitely a learning experience, but I worked with a really great editor, Carrie Thornton, at Day Street Books, which is an imprint at HarperCollins, and you know she was really drilling that into me. It's like, Ian, we have to hit these beats every so many pages, so then the reader is, be is continually being reassured that this story is going to be worth their time. Yeah, you struck a wonderful structure with it, with the the personal stuff, like you know, bringing your mother into it at at opportune times, uh, making sure that throughout the book we're kind of learning cool things about magic tricks and sleight of hand, uh, how these people you intersected with, um, you know, their victories and losses over the course of their lives, and it, every so often you just got a nice taste of all all these people throughout. So I. I as someone who likes to deconstruct these books and see how the structure is done, it's like I, I can see what you were doing. It was so well done um, that it just pulled me along. I was able to you know, read this thing in no time, and I'm not by no means a lightning-fast reader. So it was like such a, like an enjoyable experience with a cool, cool subculture to boot. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, it was uh, definitely a learning curve, but you know, uh, working with Carrie, you know, she kind of taught me that, you know, this is how books should be structured. So all this makes sense, you know, where she's like, you know, the, the emotional stuff, the top line narrative, you know, as the book goes, you see them coming together toward like at the end, you know, and, and there, you know, there's no door unopened as you go, where it's like, you know, you're ticking off all the boxes and at the end, everything comes together to like a nice tight resolution where you come away and you're like, 
wow, everything was resolved in the story and, you know, I feel better for reading it. I mean, that's kind of the ultimate goal. And I think doing the book is going to make me a a better, a better magazine writer. Um, so I hope to take some of these skills that I've learned here and apply them in the magazine world. And then, you know, as I write more books, hopefully get better and better at that, at, at, at identifying that structure before I even think about a story being a book where I can say, I can see it as a full book and this is how it's going to be. And it's the perfect story for it's the perfect structure for it. And, you know, it's going to work because that's the whole, you know, part about pitching a book as well is proving that there really is an ending that's going to act as, as a true resolution for the story. Mm. And I love, too, at the end, this kind of harkens back to the beginning of our con- conversation about sort of that inclusivity and finding family among these people. Like at the very end of the book, and this isn't like a spoiler or anything, but it's just like, you know, you co- you write that these are my people now. And I imagine that was like a really powerful thing. You were able to practice your tricks. You wrote a trick um, or wrote, uh, invented a trick. I don't know <laughs> what the exact term is, um, but like. And you you got the the fifty two tattoo and everything, and it was just like you they put their arms around you, and like that must have been an amazing feeling to dive into this subculture and then not only sort of helicopter in but to also be in, be uh be told that you are in fact one of us now, yeah. It's just strange, you know, it became like a daily part of my life, you know, I didn't even feel like I was really writing this book in that way, where it's like, oh, there's this book you have to do, it was just kind of like, well, this is my life now, and I'm just writing about it, and, you know, it was just, yeah, it was an amazing experience, and, you know, I'm I'm so glad that that it became such an integral part of my life, you know, I, I feel like I'm a better person now because of it. Fantastic. Well, Ian, you've been incredibly generous with your time. Like, thank you so much for your time and the work you do in magazines. Magic is Dead is an amazing book, an amazing debut. And I I can't wait to have more of these conversations as you churn out more and more wonderful work. So um, um, lastly, uh, where can people find you online to get more familiar with your work if they're not already familiar with it? Yeah, I mean, you can go to my website, uh, ianfrish.com. It has um, a bunch of my articles up there. And you can follow me on you know, Twitter, uh, at Ian Frisch, or Instagram, at Ian underscore Frisch. Um, you know, I'm always posting about random stuff on, on there and, and, and promoting my work when it, when it comes out. I got, a couple, I got a couple of pieces on deck for the next couple of months, so those will be out soon. They should be pretty fun. So yeah, I'll still be cranking out. I'll still be here doing my thing, you know? That was fun, right? I think so. He's a good one. Great writer. Knows a thing or two. Go buy that book. It's a good one. You'll read it quick. It's one of those. If you feel generous and you want to do something that only costs you less than five minutes of your time, which I understand is a big ask after you spent the past 75 minutes listening to this show, kindly leave a review on Apple Podcasts and link up to the show on your favorite social network. Isn't that fun? I've brought back the wildly popular promo deal. You leave a review and send me the screenshot of the published review. I'll edit and coach up a piece of your work of up to 2,000 words. It takes me about three hours to do it, so that's like $150 value there for just leaving a review. Helps the show's packaging, you know? I mean, aren't you more willing to listen to a show that has like a shit ton of nice reviews? I know I am. Keep this conversation going on Twitter, friends. At Brendan O'Meara and at CNFPod. Instagram's at CNFPod. And Facebook is the Creative Nonfiction Podcast. Is that it? Could it possibly be it? I hope so. I'm tired, man. I got a headache. It's time to go. Remember, friends, if you can't do, interview. See ya!